Hey everyone, hope everyone had a great weekend. Looking to you, Jason Kelsey. I think he had the best weekend of anyone ever. What how many beers you had? All of them, I think, is the answer there. Welcome to the Eagle Eye Podcast, Ruben Frank, Dave Zangaro. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, the Eagles have still not put out word or smoke signals uh, that Nick Sirianni is their head coach in 2024, but certainly looking that way. We'll, we'll talk about some of the hints there, some coaching changes on the staff. We'll, we'll mention some of the divisional round games because there were some fun ones this weekend. Uh, Rube, I guess let's start with the news, though, right now. We know Sean Desai officially fired. Um, look, he was really fired a, a month ago, but now he's off the staff. And, and the most noteworthy thing about it is that Nick Sirianni is the guy who fired him. Yeah, and kind of going back to what you just said, you know, you're looking for any sort of indication that Nick's definitely going to be the head coach in 2024. And the strongest – I mean, it's not something the Eagles announce. They don't announce when they're keeping a coach. Um, don't always announce it when they're getting rid of one. But uh, the fact that Nick is involved in these decisions obviously tells you he's going to be back – um, I thought all along that would that was more likely than he wouldn't, although, you know, the scales were getting closer and closer. Um, he went into, you know, he went into Jeff Lurie and had a plan and Sean Desai didn't fit into that. I think in a lot of ways, look, Sean Desai wasn't wasn't a uh, a brilliant defensive mind in his time here. But um, I do think considering the personnel he had. And some of the wins that they had before the San Francisco game, um, they did some good things with him as a D coordinator. I think he's a good coach. Um, I think it was just – he was the wrong coach. I think he was a good coach, but he was a wrong coach for this team, for this personnel, for this everything. And when it fell apart against the Niners and the Cowboys, uh, things got worse under Patricia. But, I mean, you can't take away from the fact that they – they played well against a lot of really good offenses while he was still there from, you know, Miami and Dallas, the first game. And, um, you know, the, the, the Vikings beat, I mean, they, they won some good, they had some good wins under Sean Desai. So I, think, I don't think it was a total disaster, but uh, wasn't a total success either. <laughs> yeah. I think that's safe to say uh, good guy. Sean Desai stuck around tried to help that had to be an embarrassing situation for him to be in. Uh, But by all accounts, like he handled it really well. I I think he'll have a career still. Like, I don't think this is a career ender for him. I don't think he'll be a DC anywhere next year, but he can work his way back up. Uh, I give him credit for that. Cause I look, I wouldn't have handled, he went out there at a press conference knowing he wasn't the DC anymore and played the the whole game. They wanted him to play. And that was the worst part of all of this was, in the interest of competitive advantage, they sent the poor guy out there to pretend he was the defensive coordinator before the Seattle game. I guess that was the Wednesday. No, it was the Tuesday before the Seattle game. It might have been the Wednesday because that was a month. Was that a Monday night game? Yeah. Um, that was a Monday. So it was probably that Wednesday. So that's inexcusable. You just can't do that to the guy. And you're right. He handled everything with class. Uh, you know, we would see him around. I think I, I saw him before the um, – was the last home game. I guess it was Arizona um, exchange pleasantries on the field and uh, saw him in the hallway leaving after Jalen's presser on uh, on uh, Wednesday last week. Um, yeah. I mean, he's had a, he's had an unusual career. I mean, he wasn't, he didn't play college football. Um, he was pursuing um, a degree at Temple. I guess his master's and he ended up as a volunteer assistant for Al Golden and then ended up becoming a full-time college assistant and uh, just kept working his way up. I and mean, he's a brilliant guy. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with his career. Uh, if he's in the right place with the right players and the right scheme and right people around him, uh, I think he has a chance to be successful, but uh, it wasn't going to happen here. Yeah. He's certainly done here. What do you make of the Nick situation? Because we we've been on this pod and I really thought, the Eagles would let it be known that Nick is going to be back in 2024. And they haven't done that. 
Uh, the closest we've gotten to that is Adam Schefter saying all all indications are that he's going to be back. But I, I really thought that, and this is, look, this is the way it works. Like the team has ways to get out information they want out there. It's weird to me. It's just like a weird way to handle this. And, and they didn't handle the end of Doug Peterson's time here well. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised about it. But it just seems strange to me that like it seems like they're playing the Jalen Hurts role. Like, what do you mean he could be gone? Like, it seems like right. that's what they're doing, which is very strange. Like, we know there was a discussion about it. We know that it wasn't a definite that he'd be back. And for the organization to just act like that is weird to me. Yeah, it is. And it's uh, not surprising, though. I mean, I can see whenever we do talk to Jeff Lurie, Oh, no. Oh, no, of course not. Uh, that was never the conversation. I mean, I guarantee that's what's going to happen. They'll they'll never admit that they considered it, although they did. We all know that. Um, I can just see the meetings, you know, in the Novacare complex where saying, well, we don't announce when we're keeping a coach. Why, why, why would we do that? Um, I wasn't looking for a press release, but um, like you said, there are ways to get the information out when they want it out. And they're certainly very shrewd at doing that as we've seen. Um, so yeah, surprising that, and it, you know, maybe part of it was, um, I think until, until Nick met with Jeff Lurie, I guess on Friday, they probably didn't know, well, probably nobody knew, but over the weekend, um, I completely expected one of the insiders to come on at halftime and say, you know, word out of Philadelphia is uh, Nick Sirianni's he's back for his fourth year as head coach of the Eagles. Um, he's got to make some changes on his coaching staff, but um, he'll be the head coach. There was nothing, it still hasn't been anything definitive like that. Schefter, like you said, came the closest with all indications are, um, which is kind of a a catch-all for, I think, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> I mean, I could report tomorrow that all indications are James Bradbury won't be back in 2024, and I'll probably be right. Um, but uh, it is. It's odd. It's unusual. It's surprising. Uh, it would be so easy to just leak it to somebody and say, look, he's coming back. Just get it out there. Um, it's so goofy to me. Just just do it. Just if, do you're, it. If, he's, if you're keeping him, just let everyone know you're keeping him. And now, like, there are hints. Obviously, him firing the size is a big hint. They're going forward with the defensive coordinator search. That's a pretty big hint, uh, assuming he's like – I'm sorry, go ahead. And so, Assuming he's heavily involved in it, which I, I think is fair to assume – at this point. Yeah. And it's been a week. It's been a week now since the, the Tampa game. And I mean, there's been no, look, the teams that need coaches are, are deep into interviews, second interviews. Um, I mean, Falcons, I think Falcons have interviewed like 20 people. Um, in, in the next couple of days, guys are going to start getting hired. Um, although I guess, I guess it's between the, the championship games and the Super Bowl. They're not supposed to announce them. I can't remember, but teams do anyway. Um, but the, the, the top candidates are going to be off the market really soon, and they're already behind if they decided to do something. So, well, the they were behind that, last time too. That's true. That's true. But the fact that they didn't show any urgency to I make mean, season ended Monday, and Laurie and Nick didn't even talk till Friday. That was the first sign that. I mean, if, if something's going to happen and, you know, it's true with Doug, it took, it did take a while, but usually these are things that happen the day after the season ends, you know, it's like, all right, this was a disaster. Let's uh, let's make a change. Um, I'm trying to remember before Doug, I mean, Chip got fired a week before the season even ended. Um, Andy was, was that night up at the Meadowlands we knew. Um Ray Rhodes, we we knew we knew a few weeks before it happened. Um, I'll never forget Phil Sheridan it was at the Inquirer at the time writing a piece that Ray Rhodes was was likely to be fired after the season with like three weeks left. And at the next day, at, at his presser, which was on a on a on a he was standing on a stand over on the old grass fields that's now like a parking area for Citizens Bank Park, and he, he was used to practice out there. Ray saying. Phil, everyone knows I'm getting fired. Why do you keep writing it? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then Kotai got fired the morning after the Bengals game, after they lost their seventh straight in Cincinnati in 94. Um, Buddy was fired the next morning. 
I've been fired for losing before, but I've never been fired for winning. Um, who was before Buddy? Swampy was fired a week before the season ended. Um, Vermeil kind of resigned when he was burned out. So that goes back to the 70s. So it's rare for it to get drawn out for more than a day. Uh, but Doug was the exception. Now that I've gone through the firings of every head coach of the last half. Season, I wondered how far back you were going to go. I can't go before that. But, yeah, it was unusual in, in 20, definitely. It would have been funny if we had like a – like Ray did a Chris Collinsworth slide in and just like took over like before Dick Vermeil, and we just kept going back. Well, yeah, he would probably have to take over like around around that era. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, the other big bit of news from this weekend: uh, Matt Patricia, free as a bird, uh, a, a really hot defensive coaching candidate on the market. He had a his contract is up apparently. Uh, maybe my favorite wording from a tweet ever, this is from Tom Palacero, uh, not on under contract, plans to explore other opportunities. That's not the part I like. This is my favorite part of a tweet. Patricia took on play calling last month under difficult circumstances, running someone else's scheme with a depleted unit. He'll be a top DC candidate. Where do you think that's coming from? The XFL? <laughs> I mean... Some of these, and look, Tom's got great sources and he breaks a lot of news, but some of these. <laughs> it's just, that's funny to me. Um, I don't disagree with part of that. Like, I think he was in a tricky spot. Sure. No question. But he he wasn't a, a top defensive coordinator candidate before this mess. He's certainly not going to be one after unless Bill just won some in Atlanta. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, I mean. There were some injuries on defense, but I would not sure I would say depleted. I mean, they were missing the Kobe. Um, they they missed Slay at the end of the regular Slay season. at the end, but I mean, it was already a disaster by then. Um, they were depleted by not being good. I mean, who, who else was? I mean, who else was hurt? I think Zach Cunningham missed a couple games. But, I mean, anyway, um, that's what honestly I look back at that, and that's going to be one of my favorite like funny storylines of the twenty twenty three season. Is Zach? Oh, Zach Cunningham's coming back though. <laughs> that like, that, yeah. That'll that'll save the season. Going to solve all their problems <laughs> uh, until he misses nine tackles against Tampa. Um, Matt Patricia is a fascinating guy to me, and I'd never dealt with him, never met him before. He was not – his personality was not what I expected. I expected this really harsh, abrasive, difficult guy. Uh, he couldn't have been nicer. Um, couldn't have been nicer with us. I kind of see why. I mean, he pretty much had to be. Um, you know, I wrote a piece kind of looking back at the, at the five games that that he coached, and, I mean, you don't you don't want to, like – I mean, we're just doing our job, but he was a nice guy. Um, he he reminded me of like a young movie Santa Claus. <laughs> I was going to say he reminded me of Dana Bible, who was fired in the middle as 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 OC in the middle of the gosh, what season was it? Ninety eight season, and couldn't never met a nicer guy, but never seen a worse coach in my life. He was he was offensive coordinator. He had replaced. Gruden, I guess, that year. And then he was demoted but stayed with the team and replaced by Bill Bill Musgrave, who was even worse. Um, but he he reminded me of Dana Bible, just this, like, really affable but just completely overmatched guy. Um, I'll be interested to see where, where his career goes. Not too many teams get Atlanta to fire. Atlanta is where his career is going. There's not a lot of – teams that get to fire three coordinators in one week <laughs> it's like that doesn't, doesn't happen very often but it's happening here yeah it certainly seems that way uh they're going forward with their dc search we found out uh from espn's jeremy fowler they're interviewing ron rivera uh who we know ron very well he coached here way back when he's been a head coach in the league now for many years said recently in an interview that he'd be fine going back to being a dc which tells you he wants to just get back into it apparently he got a taste for it late in the season in washington because he fired del rio and then he was that didn't go well but he was calling plays defensively this is a name that i think a lot of eagles fans are going to roll their eyes at but i i don't think it's a terrible idea 
Yeah, and you know he's one of those guys who, I mean, he has some success as a as a head coach. I mean, he he had that fifteen to one Super Bowl team uh, in Carolina, but I just think he's one of those guys who's a better D coordinator than head coach. Um, I just never thought he had the. I mean, he had success, so I can't I, I can't say that. But um, I think he's a good defensive coach, and um, yeah, he was here on he you know he's a link to the Jim Johnson era, which I think a lot of fans would like. I think um, he's also linked to Buddy, which a lot of fans would like. Yeah, and I did a story once on how he was the one guy that you know was worked with both Jim and and played for Buddy in Chicago. Um, he's also in the Cal Stanford game. He he was on the field <laughs> for that that game. Um, but, uh, I mean, he, he said, yeah, he, he learned as much from buddy as he did from Jim and, and they, those two guys really were the most influential in forming his defensive, uh, philosophies, two pretty good guys to, to learn from. Jeff Fisher was on that, on that bears team too. Uh, interestingly, one guy who hasn't been mentioned as DC candidate, <laughs> thankfully, uh, but it's a good name. It's an interesting name. I don't think it would be a, an awful hire. Why do you see either I think Eagles fans would just because it's kind of a recycled guy? Yeah, and like we've seen him not have success as a head coach recently, so I think that kind of is on people's minds. But I think there's a type they're going to go after, and I have a, a list of potential candidates. And we also know uh, from Diana Rossini of the Athletic they reached out to uh, Ryan Nielsen, Falcons, D.C., and Wink Martindale, uh, most recently with the Giants. It seems like they have a type in this cycle, and I think it makes sense. They want someone with experience. And you, you look at the situation they're in, you get it. They tried with Desai, who he had been a, a D.C. for one year before, but didn't really have a ton of experience. Uh, and that was one of the reasons they said they went to Patricia. They, they thought they had someone in the building who had more experience and would handle it better. Clearly, that wasn't the case, but we saw they they went to more experience during the season, and it makes sense if that's the way they want to go. So, like a Ron Rivera, um, Wink from the experience perspective makes sense. I don't know if, if everything else makes sense about that, but like right. even like a Leslie Frazier, I think would check some boxes. Where, where are you at on that? Like, do you think it has to be a guy with experience, or would you consider the right candidate if he was not a, a DC before? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think I would look at the candidate first. Mm -hmm. You want experience, but I mean, if he hasn't had that title um, and he's a really impressive guy, you would certainly consider him. I mean, you think of a lot of good coordinators who, you know, weren't coordinators. I mean, you have to start at some point. It, it's interesting. Ryan Nielsen was with the Eagles in training camp when Ron Rivera was coaching here. Yeah, that's true. In 02. Um, but. Uh, I, I like Leslie Frazier. I think he's another one of those guys who um, is a much better coordinator than head coach. I mean, in Buffalo, and, you know, he he wasn't there this past year, obviously, but I think three of his last four teams were top ten defenses. Um, he He's had – I think he got to the playoffs once with the Vikings as head coach, but he's just a really good coordinator. Um, and he's a guy that – it was interesting. He was, I think he was at Trinity college before he came here in 99. Andy Reed just plucked him out of like, I think they were an NAIA school that I'd never even heard of. Um, and he plucked him out of there as a, I think he started out a secondary coach here. It's interesting. Leslie Frazier, John Harbaugh, Sean McDermott, uh, all were secondary coaches with the Eagles and went on to become head coaches. And I think it's another one, but uh, I like both those names. I, I think they're both really good defensive coaches, and not just because they, they're they guys who've been here, but uh, they've had success as coordinators. Um, I think Nielsen's an intriguing name. Um, I don't think Wink's really a good scheme fit. I, I mean – can <laughs> Or uh, this is going to be rude of me because I don't know him. I don't know if it's a good personality fit either. Yeah, I, I, I kind of have a hunch that his personality would change once he's not around Dable, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. But also, him. like, uh, Sirianni is buddies with Dave, Dable, too. I almost right. called him Dabes. Like, I, like we're best friends. <laughs> like me, and Dave, me and Dable are, like, hanging out, drinking beers. Me and Dabes. Uh, just because I've, I've heard – I think I've heard, like, Sirianni call him that, and it was in the back of – and I almost just – 
said it without you would have made fun of me so bad so i got to it first um <laughs> I, I don't know if that would be a good fit from that perspective but he would be a guy that you can kind of turn over the defense to and say have at right. it which maybe freeing up nick even more <laughs> maybe I, I don't know i'm, I'm kind of like speculating here maybe having an inexperienced dc forced him to oversee the defense more than he would like or more oh, than sure. they thought was necessary necessarily sure. yeah and these guys like guys like leslie frazier and ron rivera you don't you don't have to worry about that I, I do think and this isn't related directly to what we're talking about but i don't care who the dc is they got to get better players and especially mm-hmm. in the secondary and a linebacker um and, and i mean I, I don't know if there's a defensive coordinator who could have had you know, a lot of success with what was on the roster at the second half of the year, but um, they would have done better. Um, I, I'm really, in, I'm really intrigued by by Nielsen. Um, he's the one guy out of that group I don't know, uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I like that idea. Was there anyone else on on my list that you were intrigued by? Al Harris is a guy to me that yeah, I, I think he's going to be a DC at some point here. He's terrific, and I mean, yeah. you just watch their their second their defensive backs play, and I mean, they're they're just so technically sound, and um, he's a really bright mind. He was here too. I mean, he played here. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he did. He play here at I think he was here at the beginning of of Andy. So he'd be he'd be Andy Reid coaching tree, I guess. Um, but now, do you count like D'Amico as Andy Reid coaching tree? He didn't coach under Andy, but he played under. So I guess he don't. I don't think so. Andy has enough. We don't have to help him out here. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, but yeah, I'm a big fan of Al Harris, and uh, he had that pick six off. Uh, that was one of the greatest plays ever off um, the Seattle quarterback. What was the name Hasselbeck? Yeah. Uh, in overtime, uh, that was. Uh, Hasselback said, "You know, we'll we'll take the we'll go this way and uh, and score, <laughs> or something. Yeah, we want the ball and we're going to score." Yeah, yeah, it didn't go so well for him, but uh, that doesn't make a, a good coordinator candidate. But I, I really yeah. like. I don't product. know. I think it helps. I, I like the product he's put out there. Yeah. Uh, would you call Denard Wilson? Yes, I would call him. I don't know if if that's a patchable relationship. Denard was yes. obviously the the defensive backs coach got interviewed for the DC job that went to Sean Desai. He would have been a better coordinator. I feel pretty confident. Yes. That. You see what his, his defensive backs in Baltimore are doing. Uh, I, I can tell you, he presented a very different plan than the one Sean Desai brought here. And uh, I think at the time, Nick Sirianni had a very specific notion of what he wanted the defense to look like. So. Um, and if you if you're considering guys like Leslie Frazier and Ron Rivera, who've been coaching for 20 years plus in the NFL, you're not asking, you're, you're letting that guy put his system in. And, sure. And well, so hopefully he's not going to be so steadfast with it. Like he'll have a yeah. system, but hopefully they'll be malleable to whatever players if, they have. If I'm, I mean, if I'm the Eagles and I'm really interested in, in Denard, I, I call him and I'm like, look, we messed up. We screwed up we should have hired you and we see that now and we'd like to try to make this work. Can we, can we do that? And if I'm him, I'm, we want to be a DC. He's taken other interviews already. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's certainly something that I would, I would consider. I mean, I'm not sure um, Nick wants to make that phone call. I'm not sure. Like you said, I'm not sure it is patchable. Um. I mean, Denard's a very proud guy. He's a very good coach. Uh, but if there's any chance to make it work, I would certainly get on the phone and at least try. Yeah, I'm kind of with you there. Uh, the one guy I don't have on my list because he is a defensive coordinator right now is Vic Fangio, who they would have hired. I think it's it's pretty common knowledge now they would have hired him if the timing worked out. He is the defensive coordinator in Miami. Things didn't go swimmingly down there necessarily. For him, and if there have been kind of some 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 rumblings that he and McDaniel might not like be a long term thing, so that's something to keep in mind too. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen there if he shakes free, but based on what happened last year, I think that would certainly be 
something the Eagles would be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see what happens down there. I would think he'll probably be back, but uh, in, in Miami, but uh, certainly if he's, uh, if he's not, he, he'd be up near the top of my list. Yeah. Anyone else who stands out to you? I went through, like, there are some exciting coaches from the college ranks who I think had the potential to be good coordinators in the NFL. It seems like the Eagles are going to prioritize experience here, but I might can be wrong about that if the well, right candidate is there. I think all things point to – all indications are uh, it's going to be an experienced guy, but uh, who knows? I think I think I think it'll be one of these. I think it'll be a guy who's been to DC, who's been in the league a number of years, who can come in, who has the confidence in his scheme to um, to just put it in and believe that it'll work. Um, whoever the players are, I, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think they're in a in a position right now to go for another. I don't want to say project or, but just an unknown guy without NFL experience. I, I don't think they can afford to do that. I don't think Nick can afford to do that. Yeah, I, well, I, I think that's probably true. Um, how about like Evero or Patrick Graham? Like there are other guys out there who would make some sense. Yeah, and I know people are just say, well, he, he was in Carolina. I mean, he's a really good coach, and their defense was – Defense was good. Azure Evero was like the – and he, he was good the year before that too. Yeah, they had a top five defense, which I didn't realize. Um, certainly would be on my radar. I think these are all good names. And he's taken some um, some other interviews, I believe. He was with the Broncos in 22. Uh, and he had a, he was pretty good there, too. So back-to-back years, two different cities, two different teams. He's shown he can coach. There are options. And I think they're like this is a year where there are some really attractive options. Oh, yeah. Who would be, who'd be your number one candidate? Who, who do you want? I, I think I, I really like Leslie Frazier uh, out of those options. Now, I, I think Denard, if you can make it work, I would try. I, I don't know if, if that's – Sure. If you could do that. Uh, but if you're going the experience route, I think Nielsen makes some sense. And, and I think um, – yeah, I, I think uh, even Rivera makes some sense to me. How about you? I think Leslie would be at the top of my list. I think that would be a a, a great hire. Um, he was. Um, oh, this is interesting. This is while we're doing this, yeah. we found out that uh, Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman will have their end of season press conferences on Wednesday. So there you go. Yeah. So I guess Howie would be back. <laughs> Yeah, so Nick will be head coach at least through Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the funny thing. Like the, the reason I think they waited was because last time they had the Doug Peterson presser, like everything was fine, and then he, right. that was he did that before, uh, before he met with Jeffrey. Yeah, that was not going to happen again. Um, in any case, yeah, I'm a big fan of Leslie Frazier, and uh, now that we know Nick's back. I think it would be uh, it'd be a great hire for him. Is that who you would go with? I think I would. Him or Nielsen? Yeah, Nielsen's exciting too. Uh, I, they're just good options, and it, it's a big hire for Nick, though it really is. And we'll get into the the offensive side of th- of things, but he really needs someone who can just take control on defense. Agree. Yeah, and there's some guys who can do that. Okay. Um, moving on. Anything else there? No. Okay. Let's let's take a quick break, and then we'll get into some offensive things and the divisional round and our old buddy Zach Ertz with a new job after the break. You deserve a car that thrills you, a car that puts goosebumps on your goosebumps. At Nissan, we got everything from turbocharged SUVs to 100% electric vehicles that will make your heart beat faster. Experience the thrill for yourself and shop your local Nissan store at NissanUSA.com today. Celebrity cook Steve Martorano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martorano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. 
Make reservations at Motorano's Prime on Open Table. All right, Rube, let's talk about the offensive side of things a little bit. Brian Johnson interviewed with the Titans and the Falcons. He was supposed to interview with the Panthers. Uh, Joe Person of The Athletic reported that interview is no longer happening. So two interviews for Brian Johnson. And then our old buddy Derek Gunn uh, put out a tweet saying all indications are Brian Johnson will not be returning as Eagles OC. This is just a weird situation because – there's a very good chance Brian Johnson, the Eagles don't want Brian Johnson back, but other teams are interviewing him as a head coach. And it's probably not a good look to fire someone as other teams are interviewing him as a head coaching candidate. It, it, yeah, it's just another weird aspect of this postseason so far. Obviously, around the league, and I don't think he's going to get a head coaching job, uh, but for teams to bring him in, they there's something they like about him. And you know, look, after last year, the, the year Jalen had with Brian as his QB's coach, um, people are looking at that, I guess, and, you know, deciding he's he can work with a young quarterback. Um, obviously, this year didn't go so well, so I, I don't really know. I think – I'm not sure what to think of Brian. I think a lot of the things that went wrong were not his fault, but I don't think he did a good job as a play caller with the things that – we're in his control and it, it's not always evident play to play where the call's coming from and what the options are and how much leeway Jalen has. Um, and, and what Nick's input is into maybe not particularly that particular call, but whether to be aggressive or conservative in that situation, I think it was an impossible situation for, um, for Brian. Uh, I don't think he was, he was ever able to really, um, show what kind of coach he can be. But I also think when when he was calling the place, he didn't do a great job of it. So um, I'm a little surprised he's getting these opportunities. Um, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, the Eagles would love I, – I think they would love to see him get one of these jobs. Not only would they not have to fire him if they don't want him back, but they'd get some draft compensation too. Uh the, that rule came into effect in 2020. Uh, it, it's basically like to promote minority hires at the exact level level and coaching. Uh, they, they would get uh, compensatory third round picks and back to back drafts. So to get draft picks for a guy you might fire anyway, yeah, you got you got to wait and, and see how this process plays out. Yeah, so technically he's not going to get fired until after all the openings are filled. At least the the ones that he's a candidate for. You would right, that's what I mean, all the ones that he's – yeah, so – Which stinks uh, for him in a way because, like, if he doesn't get these head coaching jobs, now he's behind finding a new job. Yeah, and I don't know how that – yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah, it's all – it's it's a weird situation very much. Um I mean, I'm not even convinced he'll be an OC if he's not, you know, if, I just don't know. I don't know what his what his options are going to be coming off this season and, and the collapse. Uh, again, it's like all these guys, like Sean, like, like Matt. And by the way, if he gets fired and then gets a head coaching job either now or down the line, does he still count as Nick's coaching tree if he, if he fires him? I guess he would. Andy fired Sean McDermott, but he's part of the Andy Reid coaching tree. Yeah. All right. I withdraw the question. Okay. Um, no, it's a good. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, With an easy answer, which is always the best question. Do you think he'll be? Do you think he'll be an OC if he doesn't get a head coaching job? I don't know. Um, I'm going to guess no. I think he'll be a QB coach. Yeah, probably. He'd probably have to like build his way back up. Now, Mike Arafolo from NFL Network reporter the Eagles had uh, talked about Jim Bob Cooter as a potential OC if if Brian Johnson isn't here. Would that do it for you? If they're like, here's Jim Bob, the offense is fixed. I I don't know. Uh, it's hard to know what to make of of him. Oh, I just don't know. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I. Like I, I've heard good things about him. He was obviously here in a advisory role. Uh, what if 
the the Eagles and Colts just swap offensive coordinators. Jim Bob comes here. Brian Johnson goes with Shane. We'll see how it works out. Well, it would work out well for the Colts because Shane's going to call the plays. <laughs> so um, he's as good as at that as anybody I've seen. Um, yeah, so, yeah, uh, that would be a good move for the Colts. Okay. Uh, what do you think happens with the offensive coaching staff? Because, like, we've talked about the defense, and it was very obvious they were going to have a new defensive coordinator. The offense, to me, though, underperformed even more relative to expectations. No question. I mean, they returned 9 of 11 starters from the Super Bowl team. And we've gone through it before. Like, a quarterback who should be an MVP candidate, two stud receivers, top five tight end, a running back who just had a career year and a Pro Bowl season, and the best offensive line in football. And Nick Sirianni is going, yeah, we're still top 10. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's like bare minimum for the talent that they've assembled. Yeah, there's no question. Um, I, I just think it was it was an untenable situation with with the way it was set up. Uh, I'm still not convinced Nick wasn't calling the plays at some points. Kind of hard to tell. Um, I don't want Nick calling the plays because I don't think he's very good at it. We saw that in 21, the first – handful of games when he's doing it. Um, but they've got to find a way that the OC and and the head and the offensive head coach can streamline things or or just make it work better because it just seemed like like Brian Johnson and Nick were they never they never got to a point where they were in lockstep where they were just one mind running an offense. It just there was you know, I don't know if it was Nick's natural tendency to be conservative and Brian's natural tendency to be aggressive. Um, maybe too much for both of them. Maybe Brian was too aggressive and Nick was too conservative, which is a really bad combination. But they've got to find a way to to get a staff in here um, that is thinking the same way, which, whichever way that is. Yeah, or at least find a better way to collaborate. Like you can have different ideas, but like oh, it has sure. to, uh, yeah. on game day, it has to blend. And I, look, I, I think there were signs all year that that trio was not working well together. And I, I don't know whose fault it was, but I'm talking about Nick Sirianni, Brian Johnson, Jalen Hurts. There was a disconnect there all season. Yeah, and I, I think it resulted in poor play from the quarterback at times, and and play that was like very hesitant. He never looked sure of himself all year, and I, and this is speculation, of course, but I, I think that probably stems from not having a lot of confidence that they're all in sync. Yeah, I don't know how many times I used the word tentative to describe Jalen and his performance, um, and he had some really good games, but there was just too many times, plays, drives, games where he just wasn't, he just didn't look like himself. He was tentative. And when you have a, a, a coach and an OC who's a play caller, who there's, I don't want to say friction between, but just not a, a really cohesive, solid working relationship, that's where you're going to get. And we saw that. Yeah. And I'm curious to see how it gets fixed. Like, is it enough to bring in a new OC and maybe like some kind of senior offensive consultant? Like, is that going to fix the the structural issues on offense. I I don't know. That's the big fear with running it back with Sirianni, which certainly looks like that's the case now. Defensively, like no matter what, whether Sirianni was here or not, they were going to have a new DC and they were going to have a new defense. But with Sirianni back, that now means the offense, at least the structure of it is probably going to be very similar. Yeah. Will it work better magically? this coming year or will there be enough schematic changes to be a better offense? I don't think it's magically going to work better. No, and I I don't have, I'll be honest. I don't have a ton of confidence that Nick's going to bend and change his offense enough to make it effective. That's to me, that's maybe the biggest question facing this team this off season. Uh, Like, I mean, you just ran through all the, all the starters who were back for the Super Bowl team, I guess it was all but Miles and Isaac. Mm-hmm. So you have you have like the, you know, you certainly replace both of them with equivalent talents. Maybe not, maybe not right guard, not quite equivalent. 
uh, fairly close to it. Um, Nick's going to have to do that, or he's not going to be here after this year. And I think that's probably part of the conversation Jeff Lurie had with Nick was, you know, you have a year to get this offense right. I mean, Jeff Lurie loves offense. He loves high flying, cutting edge, you know, riding the wave offense and innovative, uh, uh, you know, just aggressive passing offense. And I don't think Nick really has a choice in the matter. If he doesn't, if he doesn't craft an offense in that image that Jeff Lurie wants, he won't be here. Yeah. And innovative is certainly not a word I would have used to describe the Eagles offense for a lot of the 2023 season. No. What word would you pick? Stale? Stale. Yeah, stale. Um, unimaginative. Yeah. Not, not words you want to associate with your offense when you have an offensive head coach. And an offensive minded owner. Certainly. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, that's kind of the latest on all the coaching stuff. Uh, I'm excited to hear from Nick on Wednesday when we finally get to talk to him. Uh, I know we didn't plan on talking about this, but like, what are some things you want to hear from Nick and or Howie? Well, from Nick, it's, yeah, it's whoever the OC is, how much you're willing to change your offense to, um, to work together with that guy and, and be better, be more productive, be more explosive. That's, that's my question. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think there will be questions about the defensive coordinator search that they probably won't give us much on, but I am really more interested in hearing Nick's vision for the offense. Yeah, and my question for Howie would be, what gives you confidence in a head coach who couldn't reverse his team's slide over the last month and a half? Yeah, I'll be honest, though. I feel like that's uh, – Obviously, Howie's involved in the decision to keep Nick, but that's really a Jeffrey question. But we won't talk to him until the owners' meetings. Yeah, um, which is a shame. I, I really wish we we could talk to him after the season because I'd love to know what he's thinking. Uh, I watched him walk down the tunnel in Tampa, and I, I, there was steam coming off his out of his ears. I mean, he was angry, and I, I wish you could just hear what he had to say about the team, the slide the head coach. Uh, and then for Howie, I, I think I've mentioned this on a previous pod, like during the season while the season was still going on, but how much of this year will reshape his views on certain positions? Because like watch these playoff games and how many linebackers are making huge game changing plays and tackling people. Yeah. I mean like, and you got Nick Morrow running out there. Yeah. Can't keep doing it. Right. Like no. I understand it to a certain level, but they've just taken it to these, degrees that are like you have unplayable players out there unplayable players is not good <laughs> certainly not good uh we watched a lot of football this weekend I, I did at least did you watch all the games watched everything yeah um you want to go through them real quick yeah that chiefs bills game was a lot of fun uh, and one guy had a lot of fun <laughs> You messaged me in, like in somewhere in the third quarter, like in it's a really high level of football, but just back and forth, both sides of the ball making plays. And you're like the Eagles beat both these teams, and I, and I wrote back to you, you know, and in a in a seven day span, they beat both these teams. It just kind of makes you just just it it just kind of emphasizes how how great the fall was. I mean, they were beaten. They were beating really good teams there for a while. Uh, but I watched the clip of that walk off touchdown from Hertz against the Bills. And he like he, he Kelly Green, right? It's a fun night. He he runs into the back of the end zone and like puts his arms up and celebrates. And you're like, that team, that was that team was like a contender. Yeah. They're 10 and one. One point. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I think I had heard that, yeah. That was a tough game for me because, you know, I mean, I've known Andy and Sean McDermott for 25 years, both of them. And uh, they're both just class acts, great coaches. And, um, you know, I had no rooting interest. <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted uh, to see a fun game. I always feel bad for a kicker who misses a kick like that. Uh, you just, you just, you just feel so bad for the kid. It stinks, but Mahomes is going to, win that game 
Maybe. Yeah. He would have given him like a minute 40. Yeah. Buffalo's defense looked gas. I mean, they were missing. Talk about a team. They were missing all their linebackers, and they still had better linebackers than the Eagles' starting linebackers. I'd take Matt Milano with a season-ending injury. How about over, that? Whatever the Eagles had out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the kick stinks. That's a shame. Uh, I feel bad for Buffalo, man. That's just brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Scott Norwood was trending within like five seconds of that kick missing wide right. Um. Look, Sean McDermott, I consider him a friend, but, I mean, they've got to find a way to get over the hump. They're always good, but they got to find a way to to get to a Super Bowl. I mean, they just they, – they're every year they're one of the best teams in the AFC, and they just can't do it. Mahomes has never not been in a championship game. It's incredible. Yeah, I think Romo said that right when the game ended. I hadn't really put it in those terms, but um, – That's yeah, insane. It's insane. Yeah. He's just he's just a winner, man. That guy. And Andy called a great game. He really did. He did burn a timeout, which I found funny. <laughs> yeah. Um that's such an intriguing game, too, because I mean, obviously Harbaugh and and um Andy are incredibly close. Um well it is funny. If you if you do give D'Amico to the Andy Reid tree, all four of the final four. coaches in the AFC are Andy What's guys. It? I wrote that in my 10 observations that you apparently did not read. Um, but you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if I ever told this story in 2012. <laughs> um, in 2012, uh, the Ravens um, were uh, were in the playoffs. They obviously, I think they were, that was the year they won the Super Bowl, right? 2012. Mm-hmm. That was Andy's last year here. And he was in his off in, off, office. And he was on the phone with Harbs. It was like 10 o'clock at night, and they were talking for quite a while. And they just kept talking and kept talking. Uh, they were talking about matchups, talking about philosophies, how to coach in the playoffs. Now it was 11 o'clock. Now it's midnight. They're still talking. And finally, Andy said, you know what? I'm coming down there. And he just drove down to their facility in uh, Owings Mills, Maryland. Um, he got there like 2 in the morning, and they just continued the conversation at the Ravens facility. Um, they're they're extremely close. I mean, Sean McDermott was with them for a long time, but I think Harbs and Andy, um, yeah, it's a it's an incredible matchup. And again, I'm going to have yeah. well, Andy didn't fire one of them, so no, no, he promoted him. He gave him that secondary job in um, you know seven, I guess it was, and that's what that's what earned him that chance to be a head coach. And I probably told the story before, but. Uh, I drove down to to the facility when Harbaugh got the job, and uh, I drove down with um, Andy Schwartz and Jordan Rannon, um, our, our good friends. And the three of us were down there, and Steve Bashotti came over to us after Harbaugh's press conference, the owner of the Ravens, who was born in South Philadelphia. Um, and he's like, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, like, yeah, you got, it's, a, it's a great hire. It's kind of – you know, off the wall. He's never been a coordinator. And like, yeah, I'm real. I'm really stoked. I think we got ourselves a really good head coach here, and here we are. You know, yeah, say so. Years later. Yeah, so either uh, Andy will go to his how many Super Bowls? What is it? What's he been to three with the Chiefs? No, he's been been to three with the Chiefs and one with the Eagles. He'll go to his fifth Super Bowl, or Harbs will go to his second. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and then the uh, the NFC games. It, I was happy to see the Lions win. I was kind of hoping for a Lions Bill Super Bowl just because one of them would have to win it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It'd be nice funny. to see some different teams in there. Yeah, exactly. I have a buddy who's a Lions fan. And he texted me during the game yesterday saying, I don't know if I even like playoff football. This is too much for me. <laughs> he waited his whole life for the Lions to be <laughs> in this moment, and the pressure was getting to him. He couldn't take it. Uh, happy to see them win. How about CJ GJ? Big pick. Yeah. Just. I know it's another one where like the ball just lands in his hands, but at some point, and I, yeah, those tip balls, I mean, they're going to be picked off, but uh, a lot of Eagles connections there. Hank Frehley's done a really good job coaching mm-hmm. the line uh, for them. Dave Phipps, their special teams coach. Uh, so, and now Zach Ertz is there. Um, which oh one? yeah. What do you make of that? Zach Ertz signing to the Lions practice squad. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously Laporte has had a really good rookie season, um, but I mean, he hasn't played since October. Um, Ertz, that is. 
Ertz, Ertz, yeah. Um, but he's a guy with a ton of playoff experience. I mean, he caught a game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. So um, I don't know. He's not the player he used to be, but and it's been a long layoff because he was on IR for five weeks before he got cut. It is so funny to me because we heard he was going to sign with a contender. I didn't think he'd wait until championship <laughs> weekend. Yeah, so he's. I guess he's technically on the practice squad. Obviously, they could elevate him for the game. Um, they don't really have a second receiving tight end, so why not? Yeah, good for it's him. Just, I thought his career was over. Yeah, it, it, I, we thought he'd sign weeks ago, months yeah. ago even. Yeah, so. I kind of love it. I kind of love just waiting until the NFC Championship game. It's a long layoff for a guy. I mean, he's coming off an injury. He had the quad. Hasn't played since October. So it's kind of a weird situation, but I, I hope it goes well for him. Yeah, I do too. And uh, they'll play the 49ers. That was a close game. I thought the Packers really outplayed them Yeah, for a lot of that one. Yeah, that ball was in the air, that that interception at the end. I was like, as soon as he released it, thrown across the field, I just, yeah. just can't make that pass. He just can't. And he should know better. I mean, he's a really talented kid. And, uh, you know, he's going to he's gonna have a nice career. But you, you can't make that throw. And it actually reminded me of a pass Jalen would have made at the end of a game this year. That's mm-hmm. an awful thing to say, but just that really ill-advised, um, you know, the, the desperation throw when it's not yet desperation time. That's what that was. I mean, there was there was still some time, plenty of time, over a minute, I think. You don't realize, like, how much time, like, 50 seconds is until you see Mahomes drive down the field in 13 seconds. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, it wasn't desperation time, but it was uh, it was it was a great game. They were all really they were all really fun games. Other than I mean, there was three really competitive games. Uh, it was a fun weekend. It was and, good football. And the best thing about it is like I don't have to write ten observations <laughs> when they're when they're over. It's like such a relief. <laughs> you get like PTSD watching some of these games. I'm definitely triggered. Like. Oh my God! They just scored. I got to like do everything, uh, but it was fun. And uh, you know, next week, next weekend's my favorite weekend of the of the season. Um, those. Two I'm a games. big fan of the Pro Bowl weekend. See that skills <laughs> competition. Uh, yeah. So. So yeah. So it was. Uh, I, I I look. I said I've been saying Ravens 49ers since I think before the season. Um, I think that's what it'll end up being, but. Um, I don't know. Who do you think – which which row team or which lower seed team do you think is more likely to, to win? The Chiefs. They just went into Buffalo and beat the hottest team in a hostile environment. So – and they they had the experience to do it. I, uh, I like the Lions. I'll be pulling for them. I think that's a tough ask. Yeah. Yeah, the Niners haven't been quite as good. But they're just, just so talented. Yeah, we'll see about Debo. I mean, he, if he doesn't play, that's a different game. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, but I'm I'm still going to go with with uh, Ravens Niners. Okay, we can break down those games later in the week. We'll have sure. some time yeah. to do that. I want to remind everyone: if you would be so kind, please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that like button, subscribe there as well. We know it's we're off schedule. This is a weird week. Uh, eventually, we will settle down and have kind of a, a normal schedule going forward into the uh, end of the off season. But yeah, we're kind of in that spot. We felt like we had to hop on here and, and talk about some of the news that come down over the weekend. And we'll, we'll I don't know when our next pod will be, but we'll make sure we talk to you guys after hearing from uh, Sirianni and Howie Roseman on Wednesday. Any final words, Herb? No, I'm really looking forward to that availability Wednesday and hearing what those guys have to say. All right. Take care, everyone. For Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you soon.